There's a quotation on the stone. Presumably that's from one of Thomas's poems. Actually, it's from one of his prose pieces. And it, it turns out to be, I hadn't appreciated, I hadn't remembered this, but I use it as an epigraph for the book. And I rose up and I knew that I was tired and continued my journey. And it seems to say so much about Thomas's deep understanding about his own condition and yet this sort of relentlessness that he was going to go on mm. and he was going to continue. And his journey, of course, he means literal. But as we turns out, a journey also into poetry. Mm. Thanks. This is the White Horse Inn. This is the, the pub that Edward Thomas used to like to stop at more than any other right. as he was walking around from his cottage. And it was known as the pub with no name because the sign is missing and still now if you look out the window you can see the sign the signpost without the sign hanging and this is the scene where he set his first poem mm. and he was walking one day um, coming here and stopping off on one of his walks as he often did and he started to jot down some bits of conversation in prose that he heard at the bar possibly this bar <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later he's back and he starts to do something which he'd never done before which was simply to turn it into mm. poetry and that first poem is set here and there's a barmaid coming back from London and she's looking out the window and you can, she talks about the pond that you can still see out there mm -hmm. and the cows that were sort of grazing mm -hmm. around it. And this is where it begins. Two roads cross and not a house in sight except the white horse in this clump of beeches. It hides from either road, a field's breadth back. And it's the trees you see and not the house both near and far, when the clump's the highest thing, and homely, too, upon a far horizon, to one that knows there is an inn within. Why do you think that it took so long for him to start writing things down as poetry? It, he needed somebody to unlock it, and he says very early on um, that, uh, which is also tied up with his unhappiness, Thomas was a a chronic and sometimes manic depressive in his life. Um, on a number of occasions he thought about suicide, even attempted it just in the woods mm. up around nearby this pub. Part of his unhappiness was that he, he was a greatly skilled and intelligent man who had yet to find the outlet and expression that was worthy of his talents, and that would be poetry. And he says at one point early in his life that he, he believes that there will be a saviour in his life. He thinks it can't be his wife. He goes on to say he can't be his doctor. Um, but it turned out that that saviour as such turned out to be Robert mm. Frost. And at the time, neither of them were known as poets. Frost had just published his first book of poems in London. Edward Thomas hadn't written a poem at all. And there was a story of an extraordinary friendship where Frost unlocks a lifetime's desire to write poetry in Edward Thomas. And Edward Thomas recognises through his criticism, he was the leading critic of his day, the brilliance and originality of Robert Frost's work. They form a friendship and they walk the fields of Hampshire and Gloucestershire as war breaks out and Frost returns to America and of course makes his name. He sells a million poetry books in his lifetime after that. Um, and Thomas is going to join him, but um, The Road Not Taken, Frost's famous poem, um, is sent to Thomas from America and it's a poem about Thomas. It seems to make fun of Thomas's inability to choose between poetry and prose, but also crucially about the war. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. And within weeks of receiving that poem, Edward Thomas enlists with tragic consequences. One thing that is really interesting to me reading his work um, is that because the, the duration of, of time in which he wrote it was so short, it's really tied into a very specific part of the country, Hampshire. Thomas's average day was to leave his uh, study in the morning, um, go out for a walk that might be five miles in a circle of his cottage, mm. but sometimes as much as 25 miles. His working days were long, and as he told Robert Frost, I'm burning my candle at three ends mm. just to make a living. And that often meant uh, starting at eight and finishing at one, with just breaks for lunch and home for his supper. And these are the views that he looked out on from his study over what he called Look 60 miles of South Downs in one glance. It's so beautiful, and particularly on a day like today, it's just astonishing. And this landscape obviously inspired so much of his poetry. It did, and it's the setting for so much of it. But 
his whole writing life, and not just his poetry, all his prose, so much of it was topographic, written, mm. walking these hills and filling in his notebooks, what he would see and the birds and the mm. trees that he was writing about. But of course there's a great link between walking and poetry and the rhythms of footfall, both mm. in verse and in, and in life, and of course the same is true for Wordsworth. And so true for Frost too, though Frost was a little bit lazier <laughs> and uh, liked to pretend he walked further than he actually did. <laughs> <laughs> they took a lot of walks together though, didn't they? They did, and some of their great defining moments of friendship were both here in Hampshire and also in Gloucestershire, where they spent much of the day walking and talking about poetry and poets and family life and the war, of course. Mm. He was a father of three who married his teenage sweetheart but suffered long periods of depression in his family life and could be very, very cruel. He could berate his children and he could humiliate his wife. And one of the ways he dealt with that, because it, it, it tore him apart, was he thought to take himself away from it and to get himself away from his family so he couldn't hurt them anymore. Mm. So he'd go from weeks and sometimes months on end to save them as he saw it, more pain. But of course, they simply missed him terribly. This is Yew Tree Cottage, one of the three cottages in which Thomas lived in Steep and around Steep. And it was the smallest of the three cottages. It was a time of poverty and he was, he was living here during the period of the First World War. And it would be the last of the cottages that he lived in here before he enlisted. But it was also the place where he was living when he began to write poetry. That's right. And in fact, he kept his old study, which was up at his former house, up at the top of the, the hangars. And he would walk up every day, he'd leave this house at about eight in the morning and walk up the hill, work on his material, come back down here at lunchtime, do a bit of gardening at the back there, and then go back up to the cottage or go on up to the study and go on a longer walk, then come back down to, at supper time or tea time, and occasionally he'd go back up and do some more writing. And Thomas was living here at the point when he enlisted. Um, what happened to his wife Helen when he went off to war? Well, she stayed here initially. She stayed here in Steep until 1916. Edward had gone to Essex uh, as a map reading instructor and would be there for about a year before transferring to training in the artillery. But sadly, at the moment he transfers to training in the artillery is the moment that Helen moves into Essex. So she follows him and once again he's left. Mm. And she stays in Essex for, for, for those years afterwards immediately. But he's gone and he's already on his way to France. And by the front door here is, is the old man, the cutting that was a gift to Edward Thomas from Gordon Bottomley which was planted here when Thomas moved into the mm, cottage in 1913, and here it still is. Looking a bit worse for winter, but back up again in spring, no doubt. And he wrote a poem about this? He did, it was one of his earliest poems. And in fact, his fourth that he wrote in that extraordinary first week of production. And it talks about the smell on his fingers, mm. suggesting he couldn't quite know what, but that was, and it became an absolute key theme of Thomas's poetry. And the moment he says, I've lost the key, when the idea that smell and other senses can waken something in you but you can't quite put your finger on it. And it seems to be one of the currents that fuels his poems from there on in. Are there poems of Thomas's in particular that pertain to this landscape that we're looking out across? There are indeed, and there's a poem that's set and possibly the last time that he ever came here and saw here, which he actually calls When First I Came Here. And it involves the hill that we're about to walk down, shoulder of Mutton Hill. When first I came here, I had hope. Hope for I knew not what. Fast beat my heart at the sight of the tall slope, Or grass and ewes, As if my feet, only by scaling its steps of chalk, Would see something no other hill ever disclosed. And now I walk down it the last time. And we also have on the plaque on the stone Thomas's dates, born in Lambeth on the 3rd of March 1878 and killed in the Battle of Arras, 9th of April 1917. How did he die? Well, Thomas was in the artillery, so he was in the big guns further back from the trenches. And on the first day of the Easter offensive at Arras, on the 9th of April, there'd been a great Allied gain mm. by the terms of the trenches. It was, it was hugely significant and British and Allied troops were dancing in no man's land, and Edward Thomas took this moment of calm to step out from behind the safety of his observation post and leant in to lean, light his pipe, which is how he liked to do, and a shell passed so close that it seems to have drawn the air straight out of his lungs and stopped his heart, and he fell without a single mark on his body. This is his first book 
poems that was published in October 1917, some six months after he died. Yeah. But it didn't. But he knew it was coming, didn't he? He knew it was coming, exactly. It doesn't actually include the poem that's set here with the shame. He, uh, yeah, he, he that's held that true. back. But um, it does include half, almost half of the poems that he ever writes are in this, this one book.